You're listening to a message from New Beginnings Lakeside Church. Amen, amen. Let's give it up for the Kingery family. Yes, we always uh, love having them every time we get them, and uh, they always do an amazing job on Christmas. Uh, we just love that they're sharing our gifts, or their gifts with our church family. So um, before we get started today, I just wanted to let you all know that we Uh, If you didn't grab communion, we're going to have a time of communion at the end with my dad, Pastor Doug. And if you didn't grab one from the cross out in the foyer, there's no need to worry. We've got two tables set up right on our side, as well as uh, everyone should have a candle. But if for some reason you don't, there's uh, two baskets full of candles. But um, like I said, I'm just so excited you're here. My name is Jordan Warner. I'm the uh, youth and kids director here at the church. And I just wanted to welcome you and tell you that we are so excited for this message. It's going to be a special message. I'm going to start off uh, with the kids. We're going to have a time with the kids. Then my brother, Pastor David, is going to be speaking on the incarnation of Christ. And then my dad's going to finish with the gospel presentation and how this story really applies to each and every one of us. And so if you've been following along with us throughout December for our Christmas series, we've been uh, discussing how Jesus is the light of the world. It's one of the many names of uh, Christ, and it's uh, one of his I am statements. And so we're just keying in today, really, you know, facing the importance of of Christ as the light of the world. And so um, at this time, I would like to invite all of the pre-kindergarten through fifth graders up to sit and face me on the stage right here. Uh, If you want to come with your parent, that's fine. But all the kiddos come up here and sit with me. I'm going to sit here. I know it's not very conventional, but it's going to be good. So if you guys will come and sit right here for me. I've got a, a special presentation for you guys today of this message. It's going to be fun. All right, gather around, gather, gather around. All right, you guys can face me if you'd like. <laughs> I'll wait till you guys all get up here. But I wanted to take a moment today. You know, often your parents and the adults, they get a message to them. I want to share a very important message with all of you today. And in fact, it's the most important message that you will have ever heard before and that you ever will hear. And you know what this message is? It's the story of Christmas and what it means for you and for me, for all of us, okay? So um, you guys have all gotten uh, seated, and now I want to tell you a very important story that changed my life forever. And I was about your age. I was, um, you know, I, I was actually in kindergarten, I was six years old, and I went to Evansville Christian School on the east side of town, Um, and my kindergarten teacher was giving a message similar to the one I'm going to share with you today. She was giving it to our whole school for this church-wide Christmas chapel, and it was really fun, and it really helped me learn more about Christ, and I love learning about Jesus, and I still do to this day, but one of the best ways that I learn about Jesus is by using props. You guys ever done show and tell and you've brought things from, from your house and just things that you, you love and you cherish? Well, I have a presentation for you today using props. And I am going to first have your guys' attention on this, this box. I'll show the audience. So what do you guys... I know some of you may have been here in first service, okay? So no cheating if you were here. All right, this is, for, so for second service kiddos here, what do you think is in this box? Okay, he cheated, but it's okay. <laughs> it makes it fun. Anyways, when, when my kindergarten teacher shared this message with me, you know what she pulled out of the box? She pulled out a cross. And what she really wanted to hit home with us is that Christ is the reason for the Christmas season And all the gifts you could ever get, he is the most important one that you'll ever receive, okay? And so 
the same message I'm going to share with all of you today, and I'm going to share it in a similar gift box that helped change my, my life forever. And that was 15 years ago, and it still changed my life. It's, it's forever changed my life for all of eternity, okay? And so what my teacher told me that day was about Christ. It's when I really understood who Jesus Christ is and, and was. And this is going to be a great time because like Nathan said, I've got a special little, little surprise. I've got this light in the box, in this, this treasure box right here. And if you crack it, it glows, okay? So we're going to be talking about how Jesus is the light of the world today. And really, I just, I'm glad you guys came up here because I got a special surprise for you. So if you guys would just give me five seconds, Nathan, will you help me, buddy? I've got glow sticks for each and every one of you, okay? So I've got blue, yellow, and purple. Who wants blue? Raise your hand. Good, okay. Nathan's got purple, blue. Raise your hands high for blue. Good. Everyone wants blue? <laughs> you want, okay, you want to change it up? You want blue? I love blue. Blue is my favorite color. Me too. Yeah. Okay. Anybody want purple or yellow? Yellow? You want yellow? Let's get this, this little guy over here. Okay. There you go. Everyone got a glow stick? All right. Now, if you guys just crack that glow stick open, it'll start to light up just like mine here on the stage, okay? And we're going to use this for this message, okay? So as I'm, as I'm telling you this message, always look down at your glow stick. When you get back to your parents, they can even help you or you guys can help each other. Wrap them around your wrists and they become a bracelet so you can always wear it, okay? So today we're going to start the message um, of the light of the world, looking at Christ, at not really how you might think, okay? So I want you to know that even though we're going to learn today how Jesus was born a baby, just like every one of us, he was born a baby and he came to this earth, I want you to know that he already existed even before he came to this earth. You want to know how we know that? From, from the book of John in the Bible. In John chapter 1, 1 through 5, if you'll put it up on the screen, and you guys look at it right here, it says, read along with me just uh, silently to yourself. In the beginning, the word already existed, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and he existed in the beginning with God. And God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. And the word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone, brought light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. All right, before we get going even further, can you guys repeat that last verse, one line at a time? I'll say it, and then you repeat it, okay? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Good. All right. Thank you, guys. So the word, when it says the word in this, these verses, it's talking about Jesus, okay? So Aaron, if you'll put up the next slide, I helped replace the word just for, for these purposes so that you can better understand what this passage is talking about. It's talking about Jesus. So let's reread it. It says, in the beginning, Jesus already existed. Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. He existed in the beginning with God. And God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. Jesus gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Okay, guys, so when we're going we're gonna to talk about how Jesus is the light of the world today. And now that you know, based off of this, that Jesus is God, we can continue the rest of the story, and it's, it's amazing because it's all true, okay? And so our story really begins back in the book of Genesis. Genesis is a book in the Bible. It's the very first one. It's the origin story about how all of humanity, all of creation came to be. And so we know that Jesus is God, and he was there at creation creating 
with, with his Father and with the Holy Spirit, okay? And so everything was created, and guess who was created by God? Guess. Two human beings. Two, two human beings were created. Yes. Adam and Eve. Good. Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve were created by Jesus and by his Father and by the Holy Spirit. They all were creating all of mankind. They said that they would create them in God's image, okay? And so as we learn from John, Jesus was there. So I want you to remember that. Jesus was not created. He was not a created being. He is a creator. He was there at the beginning, okay? So up until that point, the created beings, Adam and Eve, all that they had known was the light, was God, his righteousness, all of the, the goodness of God. That's all they had known. But then one day they did something that, that you know, really marked their journey and all, all of our journeys. They ate from this tree called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And you know what happened? They became aware of the dark. They knew the light. But then they became aware of the dark. Before that, they didn't know. They didn't know that dark existed. So this is when sin entered the world. And Adam and Eve learned of the darkness that sin brings. When sin entered the world, Adam and Eve rebelled. And they rebelled against God and they disobeyed them. And therefore they sinned. And now there's this sin nature that all of us have, have contributed to. How many of you have ever you know, lied to your parents, I've done it, or disobeyed them, or done something that we shouldn't have. I bet we all have. Yes, we all have. We're human beings, just like Adam and Eve. And so when they sin, God made an important promise to them. He made a promise that he would send a rescuer who would come from the woman, from Eve's family, and this rescuer would bring the life to mankind through his life. Just give me five more minutes, guys, okay? So this rescuer would bring his light and therefore bring light and bring life and restore mankind from the darkness that they had fallen into, okay? So as we read in John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, we know that Jesus is this rescuer, okay? As years passed, the Israelites, who are God's people, they waited for him to keep his promise that this rescuer would come. And even the prophet Isaiah, can you guys say that with me, Isaiah? Isaiah, it's a cool name, isn't it? So the prophet Isaiah shared a message about God's promise to send this rescuer, and he, he called the rescuer the Messiah, which means anointed one or chosen one. And this is what Isaiah said. This is what he wrote in Isaiah 9. The people are living in darkness now, but they will see a great light. A light will shine on them. Reading on further in that chapter, it says, this is how God will keep his promise. You want to know how he keeps his promise? Okay. So a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. And so here we see that Isaiah was speaking about Jesus coming to this earth. And David, in a second, is going to really talk about that. But that very light, if you lift up your glow stick, if you look at it, that very light that is coming from your glow stick is to remind you of the light of the world who came into this world to rescue you and me from our sin, from the darkness, okay? So how many of you have ever been in the dark before? I have. And it, the dark can be scary. You know why? Because you can't see. I know, I am too. So you can't see where you're going. And that's why... We need light. Light in and of itself is what we look to. Darkness is the absence of light. But when light comes in the room, we get direction. We see where we're going. So this is how it is with sin. When we disobey God, we won't know where he wants us to go or what he wants us to do. But one of the greatest attributes of light, like I said, is that it shows people the way that they should go and the way that they should act. And so remember, guys, on this Christmas, 2021, remember to always focus on Jesus, who's the light of the world. 
And you know what Jesus said in John 14, later in John, in the chapters, John 14, 6? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to my Father except through me. He's the way. He provides the light. Jesus is our guide, and we need only to follow him because he lights our path and shows us where we should go and what we should do. And so I want to thank you guys all for listening to me. You guys have been really good, and uh, you get to keep these, these awesome glow sticks. And I hope that you learned about how we needed Jesus to come to this earth so his light would save us from the darkness that comes with sin. So you can all now sit, um, go back and sit with your parents. Again, thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. So the Horner ladies are now going to come up and read uh, of Christ's birth from Luke chapter 2. Uh, it's going to be my sister-in-law, Jessica, uh, my wife, Emily, and my, my mother, Jennifer. So if you guys would just come up. All right, Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which was called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and lied him in the manger because there was no place for, him, for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was... the with a, the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with him, whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Great. Thank you so much for taking us through the Christmas story there. Luke chapter 2, of course, the classic Christmas passage. Well, I'm excited to, to be with you and share a little bit more about the Christmas story this morning. My name's Pastor David, if you don't know me. And we're talking about light of the world this year, right? And we know Jesus himself is the light of the world. Now, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm a Christmas person. I love Christmas. I'm, I'm one of those people who... You know, I don't even care if it's Thanksgiving, start Christmas before Thanksgiving. That's what I like. I think as I'm getting older, I'm becoming one of those people. Some of you guys are shaking your heads at me right now. I can't see you, but I know that there's people who are looking at me with the disgust on their face. But I love Christmas. Now, every year, though, I think it's so important to just pause, uh, to kind of quiet our hearts and quiet our minds and, and remember what it is that we're actually celebrating. And what is that that we're actually celebrating? Well, John chapter 1 answers that for us. Joel read the first five verses, but John goes on to say, 
in John 1, 9, that the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. The light was coming into the world. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas, that God was sending his light into the world. But how would he do that? Well, uh, verse 14 of John 1 answers, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. See, this was the way that God chose to send his light into the world. God chose to become a human being. Now, this is a doctrine that theologians call the incarnation. And if you want an easy way to think about it, just think about it like this. It's the doctrine of God in a bod. That's what it is. Jesus becoming flesh. He existed before the foundations of the world. He existed eternally as God, but he became one of us. So this morning, what I want to do is look at three things that the incarnation means for us. Three implications of this God becoming a human being for our lives. The first is this. The incarnation means that God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. Now, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know that there are prophecies that relate to the Messiah, right? The chosen one, the deliverer that God had promised to send into the world to deliver people from sin and to set up a kingdom that he would rule forever. And the Old Testament prophets spoke of this deliverer. They said things like in Micah chapter 5 that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. In the book of Malachi, that a messenger would prepare his way. The book of Zechariah, that he would enter Jerusalem as a king riding on a donkey. And that he would be betrayed by a close friend for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah also wrote that the Messiah's blood money, that money with which he was betrayed, would be used to purchase the potter's field. Isaiah wrote that the Messiah would remain silent when he was afflicted. And David in the book of Psalms wrote that the Messiah would die by having his hands and feet pierced. Now that's just eight prophecies. There's over 300 messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, but that's just eight of them. And you can see how specific they are to the life of Jesus. Well, there was a man named Peter Stoner in the 1950s who he was the chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at the uh, University of Pasadena in California. And he was a believer, and so he decided to use his math skills, and he calculated the probability that one man could fulfill just those eight prophecies I just mentioned to you. What are the odds that one man could fulfill just those eight prophecies? And what he found when he did all of his calculations were that the chances of that happening were 1 in 10 to the 17th power. Now, to give you a visual of what that means, imagine that we fill up the state of Texas with two feet deep worth of silver dollars. And I mark one of those silver dollars and throw it in and we mix it all up. And then we blindfold someone and we send them into Texas and we say, on your first try, pick the one that we marked. Those are the odds of one person fulfilling just those eight prophecies. And yet, Jesus didn't only fulfill those eight, but many more. It was virtually impossible. But he did it. Why? Because he was fulfilling God's promises. See, Matthew summarizes Christ's birth in his gospel by saying this. He says, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the mouth of the prophet. Then he gives another prophecy. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, the point is this, that Jesus came to the earth to fulfill what God had spoken. And that's what the incarnation means for us. When we look at it, we're reminded that God is a God who fulfills his promises. He fulfills what it is he says he's going to do. And that's why when we read in scripture things like 
that God promises to save us from our sin if we just simply believe. We might think to ourselves, wow, that, that kind of seems crazy. It's that simple. That I just trust Christ and he's going to forgive all my sins, all my wrongdoings. But God fulfills his promises. He's going to fulfill his promise to raise us from the dead. He's going to fulfill his promise for us to live eternally with him. He's going to fulfill his promise to come back to the earth. Now, those seem like crazy things at times. When we, all we've known in this world is a world where people die, we don't see them after they die, they're gone. We've never experienced what it's like to have Jesus here with us, so it's hard to imagine Jesus coming back and looking up one day and seeing him coming on the clouds. But God has promised that these things will take place. Of course, one of the greatest promises that he's going to work all things together for good for those that love him. I want to encourage you this morning, as you think about Christmas and as you remember the incarnation that God became a man, remember that God is going to fulfill his promises to you. Well, the second thing that I want us to look at this morning, the incarnation means that Jesus understands. That Jesus understands. Now, some people have this view of God as this cold, distant, uninvolved God who has got other things to worry about. He he doesn't have time to think about us. He's busy running the universe. But in the incarnation of Jesus, what we see is that God came near. He came near to us. And he chose to enter into the human experience and everything that came with that. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, describes Jesus in this way. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. See, Jesus experienced all the same things that we as human beings experience, right? He experienced sorrow and grief. He experienced rejection. He wept. He felt pain. He lost loved ones. He felt emotion. He felt righteous anger. He experienced injustice. He bled and he sweat just like we do. He got tired. He had to take a nap sometimes. He had to eat because he got hungry. He entered into the human experience. Of course, he experienced every temptation that we experienced as well. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says this, We do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are and yet without sin. There's a man named Paul David Tripp who has written a wonderful devotional called New Morning Mercies. I like to read it sometimes. And here's what he says in his book. He says, our high priest understands what it is like to be a human being in this fallen world because in an act of shocking, condescending love, he took on human flesh and lived with us as a man. This means that our struggles and prayers are not greeted with harshness, condemnation, or impatience, but with understanding and sympathy. Jesus sympathizes with you and what it is that you're going through right now because Jesus has experienced it. He's experienced it and more. He knows what it is to be a human being. But not only does he sympathize with you, here's what Hebrews 4.16 says. It says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That we serve a king who doesn't only sympathize with us, but he's available 24-7, living in us to help us in our times of need, to help us overcome the temptations that we struggle with over and over and over again, to help us in the difficult seasons of our lives. 
And you know how it is when you're going through something hard. It's one thing for a person to say, oh, I'm really sorry that you're going through that. It's another thing for a person to throw their arm around you and say, I've been through this before, and I'm going to walk through it with you. But That's what Jesus does for us. See, the incarnation means that Jesus understands. He understands what it is you're going through, and he wants to help you. And finally, the incarnation, this is where we close means that you are deeply loved, that you're deeply loved. Philippians chapter two says this, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, which means that was his substance, he was in the form of God in the sense that that is his essential nature, that is his essence, that Jesus is God, Although he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, Jesus was willing to lay aside the privileges of his godhood. He was willing to lay aside the glories of heaven. And we learned during the kids' time that Jesus existed before all things. He's the creator of all things. He sustains the universe by the word of his power. John 17 says that he existed with the Father and received glory with the Father before the world began. And here's the thing. Jesus did not need to become a human being. He was doing just fine without us. He was doing just fine. He didn't need us. But he chose to lay aside his privileges And become a human being that was spat upon, that was unjustly accused, that was blasphemed, that was crucified. God didn't have to do that. But he chose to. He didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But, verse 7, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant doesn't mean that he let go of his godhood. He still remained God even as he walked this earth. He didn't subtract anything from himself. Rather, he added a human nature. He became a human. And he emptied himself in this way by taking the form of a servant. That's what it means. By being born in the likeness of men. See, for Jesus, emptying himself meant becoming one of us. Verse 8 says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, as you go home and you've got your Christmas tree set up with your nativity underneath it, or maybe you have it you know, set up in your kitchen or on a table somewhere, you know, at the focal point of that nativity is a little statue of a, of a manger with a baby lying in it. And let us never forget that that baby that we celebrate at this time of year, he was born to die. That's the reason he came. That was his mission. He came to die. And why did he do this? He did this because of his great love for you and for me. Love is what drove him to the cross. Love is what... Uh, drove him to stay on the cross. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, the incarnation means that you and I are deeply loved. So as we come to this time in the service, uh, we kind of land the plane here and we're going to hear in a minute, if you have your communion, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to lead us through communion this morning. It's a little different than we normally do. We generally just have our own personal time, but I do want you to be thinking about your heart and your, your mind as we begin to prepare uh, for that. And I want to prepare as we understand what Christ did in coming. Uh, we've heard the incarnation. We heard Joel's message of the gift of the light. Um, but I want us to look at the scripture that the ladies read and, and just for a moment to look at these shepherds 
who are just out in the darkness like you guys are. I can't even, I really can't see you. And it's, 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 uh, uh, this was how it would have been for them. They were in the dark, and, and uh, these shepherds were probably uh, the caretakers of the lambs from the temple sacrifices. And I find that fascinating that, that the angels appear to the shepherds and then tell them about this babe in swaddling clothes um, at, in a manger, and they, they went to see and that's a picture I want us to, to understand this morning is that we come and see, that we come and see every time we come to worship. We're coming to see Christ in, in our lives and for our lives. We're coming to see him this morning as the, the baby, the child that came to die. We, we, we see him as our Savior. That's what the angels proclaimed. They proclaimed the first gospel message that you will find, you know, he is Christ the Lord, and, and that, that Christos and, and this, this uh, idea that he was the anointed Messiah that was to save the world from their sins. And so as the, 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 these shepherds came, the, the shepherds who were caring for these little lambs that would become the sacrifice for Israel, they're coming to see the Lamb of God. They're coming to see the Lamb of God that would take away their sins. And so as we look, as we look to take uh, the communion this morning, I would encourage us to take uh, the bread. Uh, it's on the top of your cup. I want you just get a hold of that little wafer. And as we, we remember what Christ, he gave his life. I, I want us to understand we talk about Jesus dying, and yes, he did. Uh, but he gave his life. For, uh, our, for, our, for ours. He took our place, his, his life for our life. And it's a miraculous trade. And it's a good deal for us. It's a good deal for us because Christ took care. We've been studying Romans this year. And, and the gospel message, the good news um, is, is uh, euangelion. This is the word that the, the, that the angels used here in this story. It's the ver- verb version of this, that Christ came to give his life to be our Savior. That was the good news that the angels came, came to tell the, the shepherds, and the shepherds came and saw. So this morning we come and see Christ uh, who died, who gave his life, who came to give his life. So I want to pray, Lord, thank you for your body that was broken for us, that, that you gave your life for our life, and we thank you for that grace and mercy, and we remember this morning uh, what you have done for us in this Christmas season. In Jesus' name, amen. So Christ's body broken for you. So the next thing that happened, they go and see this baby. Wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now, I want you to understand what wrapped in swaddling clothes was not, was not uncommon. We wrap our babies in swaddling clothes. I mean, you think of a baby, how comfortable they are. They're, they're just bundled up, and they love that tightness and that, you know, security. I mean, there's all kinds of comfort about the swaddling clothes. What, made, what set this apart was this babe was lying in a manger. A manger was a feeding trough, was a feeding trough, and that was something you would never have done, put a child in a feeding trough, but there was no room in the inn. And so this, this separated every other baby in Bethlehem that night from, from the babe uh, Jesus, you know, Jesus Christ, the Lord. And they were able to find him. And they, they were astounded at the fact that the angels had told them this very thing. And then they, got to, they came to see and they saw. And when they left, they proclaimed. They glorified God. They told people. So we come and see. But then, as the, as the King Reasons started this morning, we go and tell. We go and tell. We go and tell the world. We, we tell ourselves every day, every moment of our lives, we're thankful for the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus Christ for our life. We go and tell the gospel message that the good news is salvation 
through Jesus. It's a, a new life, a transformed life, a life-changing moment. And I, I know that the people, you know, they marveled. That the, the Scripture says that the ladies read this morning from Luke chapter 2 that the people marveled. And sometimes you marvel at something and you marvel of it, at it, even not even quite understanding it. And I'm sure they just quite, couldn't quite. Some people couldn't understand what these shepherds, these outcasts, you know, people didn't like shepherds. You know, there was, as I was studying about shepherds in preparation for this morning, you know, there was, a, there was an idea that your things were their things. They liked to steal stuff. And they moved around a lot. Because they were, they were outcast and rejected in, in these areas that they would go. And, and so, you know, there, there's these lowly shepherds that God, through these angels, heralding. Herald, hark the herald. Listen, that's what, that's what hearken means, to hearken, to bring your attention to exactly what God, you know, is, is proclaiming. And they were, the angels Harked the herald. They spoke the gospel message, and therefore, in turn, these shepherds were hark. They were hark the shepherds. They hearkened to people. They told people. They came and saw, and then they went and they told. They told of the story of this little baby. This little baby that would grow up to be the sacrifice and that his blood would cover our sin. He would be the ultimate sacrifice for this world, for our, our, for our salvation. And it's for everyone. It's for everyone who would receive, as David was saying, it's simply receiving the gift. Receiving the gift that God wants to give you through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And when we go to heaven someday, if you've given your life to Christ, then you can plead the blood of Jesus Christ over your life. Why should I let you in my heaven is what God would say, perhaps. And, and all we proclaim that Jesus Christ covers us. We are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. His sin, our sins are forgiven. And praise the Lord, because I've sinned. I've sinned in my life. And it's not that I get up every morning thinking, how am I going to be disobedient to God today? I get up every morning Praying, Lord, give me the strength to follow the things that you would have me to do. And do I do that perfect, you know, perfectly every time? No, I fail. And for John for one, for you know, First John one nine says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, not just some, all. And so this morning we come and we see what Christ has done, and then we go and tell. So we come to see, again, this, this understanding of Jesus' blood. So let's take the cup. We're going to have a blessing on, on this, and then we're going we're gonna to drink from it. So, Lord, thank you so much for your son, uh, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice of his blood on the cross for each of our sins. And we thank you uh, for salvation through him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. His blood for the forgiveness of our sins. So each week that we come to worship, each time we come to the word of God, each time we fellowship with believers, we come and see all that God has done in and through Christ and for our lives, and then we go and tell. We go and proclaim. We become the heralds. We become the heralds of God's message of the gospel to the world around us. So I'm going to ask uh, Ron and his family to come back now and lead us as we come to this, ta this candle, which is a picture of, of going and telling. It's Jesus is the light of the world. And he told us that we, when we, re when we come and follow Christ, we become the light. We bear the light in our lives, and we go and tell a world, and we light up the darkness of this world. And sometimes the darkness doesn't like to have the light, because the light reveals things. And we got to be honest with ourselves if we're living in the darkness, and we see the light come in and reveal the things that are within us. We got to be, you know, we got to be honest with ourselves and and follow after God, and receive His forgiveness and His direction for new life.
that we become lights to the world. This room is about to become lit with the light of God's love through these candles. And that's a picture for us to go and tell. Go and tell. We come and see. We celebrate with one another and worship week after week, study together uh, through different groups and all the things in our church, personal study. We come and see Christ and all that God is through his word, and then we go and tell. So we're, gonna, we're going to uh, get, get these candles lit, and then the, the Horner family is going to come and light your candles, and we'll sing. They're going to lead us in a song, and then uh, we'll close things out. <laughs>